No, it is on. Okay. Good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Well, we've made it to halfway. <laughs> two weeks down. Wow. Two weeks to go. Task, task is long, but glorious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Igor Klebanov, one of the two scientific organizers, is gone. These are the first two weeks. Miriam Svetich, who is your other scientific organizer, will be here later today. Um, and in the meantime, we're continuing with Sylvia Fufu telling us about CFT in more than two dimensions. All right. Um, I should say again that uh, more than two dimensions um, for this lecture series means three dimensions, <laughs> one at a time. Um, and just a brief review of what I ended with um, uh, on Friday. So I started explaining how to construct explicit conformal field theories in three dimensions. One example, um, so that means with Lagrangian descriptions, one example is uh, free theories of scalars or fermions. These are conformal in any number of dimensions, not just in three dimensions. But then in three dimensions, um, we can um, make the scalars and the fermions interact. And it's believed in many situations that um, in the infrared, um, the theory flows to a um, non-trivial conformal field theory. Um, one example of that is the ON vector model where we start with N scalars. So I goes from 1 to N. These are real scalars. And uh, we have a kinetic term, we have a mass term, and we have a quartic interaction between the scalars. And if we tune the mass appropriately in the infrared, we can reach a conformal field theory. And that conformal field theory, um, that's a critical ON vector model. Um, and it's solvable in the large n limit. Um, it becomes almost free. Um, in particular, the dimensions, the scaling dimensions of the scalar fields are one half, the free scaling dimensions plus order one over n corrections. Um, but it's not quite, that doesn't work for all the operators. The, for the ON singlets, they acquire a um, order one anomalous dimension. Phi i, phi i in the free theory has dimension one because each scalar has dimension one half, but this, the critical point it has dimension two. And my understanding is that Igor explained how that um, happens in these theories using a hubbard stanovich trick and phi i phi i corresponds to the hubbard stanovich field. Okay, another example is we start with N Majorana fermions. Um, so again, I goes from one to N. And we can add, we can also have Majorana fermions in a scalar field. Um, and we can have a mass term for the scalar field, quartic interaction, and also a Yukawa term such that we make the scalar field interact with the fermions. And it's also believed that if we tune M squared in the infrared, we flow to a non-trivial conformal field theory. Uh, it's again almost like the free theory. So for instance, at large n, um, psi i has dimension one, that's the free, that's the free dimension of a fermion in, in three dimensions. Um, but it doesn't work for all the operators again. For instance, for this scalar field phi in the, in the UV has dimension one half, but in the infrared has dimension one. Okay, so you can think of this, of this Lagrangian here as an RG flow between a free theory and some interacting CFT. And same here, you can think of it as an RG flow between a free theory, the free theory of n fermions and one scalar, and some interacting theory. What's interesting about it, well, so both of these theories have ON um, global symmetry. Um, the scalars have ON symmetry because they're real, and so do the fermions if they're Majorana fermions in three dimensions. And one thing that's interesting about this theory is that if we, so suppose we are at the conformal fixed point, so that means we tuned M squared, but now we don't want to tune M squared anymore. So we turn on some, some uh, we change M squared by a little bit. Then what happens at low energies is that this scalar field becomes massive, so we can forget about it. And what we obtain is a theory of free fermions. So the RG flow for this theory is the other way around in some, in some sense compared to this one. This one flows from n free scalars to some interacting theory. But this one, suppose we start with the interacting theory. And then if we turn on this deformation, we can flow to a 
theory of free fermions. Okay? Well, once the scalar field is massive, we can just integrate it out and forget about it. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so then we just forget about that term. No, 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 no. They still be, they still be massless. The scalar field is the only thing that 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 uh, sure. gets a mass. Out, why don't you get a one over m squared from the You can argue based on the on the symmetries of the mass term for the fermions would would break uh, parity. So that that wouldn't be that that wouldn't be generated. Of course, if your UV theory doesn't have the symmetry, then you have to tune something else, namely tune the mass term for the fermions such that um, you have a critical, um, you have a CFD in the infrared. And, okay, slightly more complicated example. So three dimensions is interesting because um, we can have non-trivial conformal field theories with just scalars and fermions. Um, but, of course, we can also have gauge fields. And examples are uh, QED. So this is kinetic ma the, the Maxwell term. So for instance, for a U-on gauge theory, we can also have non-abelian gauge theories. So for a U-on gauge theory, um, this is a kinetic term, and then we can have some um, complex fermions charged under this gauge field, say with unit charge. And maybe we can also add a charles simons term. And um, it's believed that if the number of fermions is, at the very least, if the number of fermions is large enough, then in the infrared there's a conformal field theory. Um, for a small number of fermions, it's not entirely clear, but um, uh, the, with a large number of fermions, one can prove in the 1 over n expansion, where n is the number of fermions, that there's a conformal field theory. And uh, one can have a similar thing uh, for scalars, and um, again, same, same thing. Okay? And uh, of course, these are the simplest examples, and we can construct more and more complicated examples. So using these, these ingredients, it's possible to construct um, pretty complicated theories. Um, if we uh, tune, uh, if we arrange the matter content appropriately and we tune the couplings, we can have supersymmetric theories um, with up to eight um, uh, supersymmetries. Um, yes? Right, because I'm assuming that I'm, I'm preserving. Right, I, I could add I could add the mass term, but the mass term breaks parity. Um, so if I don't if I don't write it, it won't be generated. Um, and one thing I want to mention about these things it might seem like a lot of can construct many theories, but um, something that's been um, uh, worked out. Uh, in detail in the past few years is that there are lots of dualities between them, in particular between these classes of theories, also the theories with non-abelian um, gauge groups. And uh, let me just, uh, I think I should mention some of these dualities because they're very exciting. Um, so uh, dualities, and these reduce a little bit the number of distinct conformal field theories we can have. So, um, uh, for instance, um, the n equal 1 scalar QED theory, uh, which is described by this Lagrangian, a mu phi squared, so phi is complex, plus phi squared squared. I'm not writing the mass term, then that means we have to tune it in order to reach a conformal field theory. Uh, and the claim is that this has the same IR CFT has um, the O2 model. So um, this is uh, d mu phi i squared plus lambda phi i squared squared, where i um, goes from 1 to 2. So this is the O2 model. And they flow to the same conformal field theory. This was uh, um, conjectured and it was actually proven um, long ago by um, Halperin, Dasgupta, uh, Peskin.
And uh, there's similar dualities um, that have been <coughs> discovered more recently. For example, if we add a trans-Simons term to this theory, so if we have d mu minus i a mu phi plus phi squared squared plus uh, k equal 1 trans-Simons term. So maybe I didn't mention that the trans-Simons level here has to be quantized. And the way it's written is quantized in integer units. And uh, so this so it's just the same theory, but we add a k equal 1 to Simon's term. It flows to an IR CFT. And uh, this, uh, this IR CFT is the same as uh, the free fermion, free complex fermion. Well, this is work of well, several people, some of them in high energy, some of them in condensed matter. So, Cyberg, Witten, uh, Santel. Okay. What's that? If k is larger than one. Um. Well, I don't think. In this class of theories, there are lots of dualities. Um, I don't. I don't remember precisely which theory is dual to to which one, but there are many dualities. Um, I don't think that the one that has k equal 2 has a simple dual description, but I, I might be wrong. What is that? Yes. Um, okay. And um, one thing I want to mention about the gauge theories um, is that, so in gauge theories, And for simplicities, for simplicity, I'm just talking about U1 gauge theories, but I could be talking about more general non-abelian gauge theories. Um, there are local operators that are of two kinds. Um, one kind is gauge invariant combinations of the matter fields. So, for example, the matter fields in the Lagrangian. So, for example, in this scalar QD theory, uh, one operator would be phi star phi. Uh, we can have more complicated things. I don't know, like f mu nu, phi star. Well, matter fields and, and gauge fields. So, field strength. Uh, f mu nu, phi star, d nu box phi or something like that. I don't know. We can write many things. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just a free fermion. Um, right. The free fermion is a free complex fermion, so we've got a, a U1 global symmetry. And we can try to ask you can try to couple that U1 global symmetry to a background gauge field. And then I'd have to tell you exactly how to couple this theory to the background gauge field such that the two are equivalent. Um, okay, so there are two types of operators. One of them, uh, one type is just products of the matter fields, and the other type is monopole operators. Um, and uh, let me mention their, their definition. So gauge theories in three dimensions have a U1 global symmetry um, where the conserved current for this symmetry, J mu, is the Hodge dual of the field strength, epsilon mu nu rho, F nu rho. This current is conserved because when we act with the derivative and contract the indices, then uh, on the right-hand side, we get the Bianchi identity for the field strength, and that's automatically zero. So this is what happens for um, all gauge theories or U1 gauge theories in three dimensions. 
and it's uh, special to three dimensions. Okay, and um, so there's a U1 global symmetry. T stands for topological. It's related to the topology of the gauge group, and the monopole operators are operators charged under U1 T. Um, local operators that are charged under U1 T. And their expressions, they cannot be written simply in terms of the matter fields in the Lagrangian, but it's good to know that in three dimensions there are these kinds of operators as well. And they play very important roles in these dualities. Um, for instance, the free fermion over here, you know, this theory on the left hand side doesn't have any fermions, so where do the fermions come from? Um, well, the fermion here it would be one of the monopole operators. Yeah. Uh, um, well, in this case, um, so what the monopole okay, so what the monopole operators do is that they you can just think of them as introducing some they turn on some uh, gauge field, um, so some field strength. So if you insert the monopole operator um, at some point, then um, so suppose it's the monopole with charge N. So this is the U1T charge. Uh, what the monopole operator does is that if you then measure the gauge flux through a small sphere surrounding it, um, there are um, N units of flux. So this is flux um, um, I need to get my conventions right um, 2 pi times N. So the integral of f over the sphere is 2 pi n. Now, what happens is that in this monopole background, they're called monopole operators because this is like a monopole background for the gauge field. In this monopole uh, background, um, these uh, the matter fields um, have um, um, well, they behave as fermions for an odd number of um, flux units. Um, the matter fields are not gauge invariant, however. But when the turn Simons level is k equal one, turning on the about a, a, a flux of a one unit, meaning two pi, is also not not a gauge invariant um, thing to do uh, because of the turn simons term. So we have to combine that with one of the matter fields. And then we get some um, uh, fermion. That's how the fermion arises. Did that sort of answer your question? So the matter fields do change the statistics in, in, the, in the background magnetic flux. And you have to, you have to, in order to build a gauge invariant operator, you have to combine the matter fields with this process of turning on some um, magnetic flux. Okay. Good. So that's what I was going to say for now about the um, explicit constructions of CFTs. Um, and uh, hope hopefully this was good enough motivation for studying CFTs more abstractly. Um, and I'd like to work towards studying them using the bootstrap. For that, there's a number of basic facts about CFTs in more than two dimensions that um, you guys should know. Um, so CFT basics 
Now, the thing is, David Simmons Duffin gave um, the Taz lectures on this a couple years ago. He has really good notes. So I don't think it would make sense to do the same thing again. So maybe I should just mention some of the, and my understanding is that Xi'in also covered some, some of this and other people. Um, so I'd like to go pretty quickly over this and just make a list of things that you should know and emphasize some things that are interesting about them. Okay? So what are the what are these facts? So the first one is that the symmetry algebra is S O D plus one comma one um, in um, Euclidean signature or S O D comma two. So this is for CFT, CFT in D dimensions. Let's just focus on Euclidean for now. Um, the generators of this algebra are rotations, rotation generators, translation generators, special conformal generators, and dilatation. And um, I think the most important thing, you know, you can just write down the commutation relations between all these things. Um, I'd like for now to work with anti-Hermitian generators. Um, so if I want to represent these as d plus 2 by d plus 2 matrices, they would be anti-symmetric matrices. Um, and we can write down the commutation relations between um, various pairs of uh, generators. I think the most important ones are that dilatation with p mu is p mu and dilatation with k mu is minus k mu. Are people familiar with what, what these generators are? I assume so. Yes? Everyone's good? Okay, good. Um, good. So the reason why I wrote down those commutation relations is that you know, by analogy with raising and lowering operators and quantum mechanics, you can see that P mu acts as a raising operator for the eigenvalues of D, and K mu acts as a lowering operator for the eigenvalues of D. Now, that's some abstr abstract thing. We'd like to think about theories that are conformal field theories, the theories that have the symmetry algebra as having conserved charges. So all these things should correspond to conserved charges. So m mu nu, p mu, k mu, d, conserved charges. Um, and now the question is, what is a conserved charge operator? One way to think about it is that um, it's not a local operator, it's a non-local operator. Um, and it's um, supported on a co-dimension one surface. And you can use it, so for instance, if I have some operator here, oh, and I want to say that it's charged under some global sy symmetry, and I have a charge operator Q, um, which is a surface operator, and I can just surround this O with that um, surface operator. It's a co-dimension one surface, so uh, it can surround a point, and I can, uh, this way I can measure its charge, okay? Um, it's an interest, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about conserved charges. Um, and in this case, I can construct the, um, the conserved charges associated with all those generators uh, pretty easily. Uh, another, way, another thing I should mention about this is that if we deform the shape of the surface, the answer wouldn't change. So this is a topological co-dimension one operator. Okay, so 
I can write down the um, charges associated with um, uh, these generators in the following way. So Q epsilon sigma, sigma is the surface along which this thing is supported. And it has this expression, it's an integral over sigma, area element, some vector, epsilon lambda of x, t nu lambda of x, where this is a stress tensor. So these charges are related to the stress tensor. They're integrals of the stress tensor along some uh, co-dimension one surfaces where this epsilon here is a, is a vector field. I can think of it as a vector field. So in particular, epsilon is d mu if um, the charge that I'm talking about is p mu. Epsilon is x nu d mu minus x mu d nu if q is m mu nu. Epsilon is x mu d mu if q is the dilatation operator. And there's a similar expression for the uh, super, the special conformal generators for um, Q is K mu. You can check that these charges are conserved provided that the stress tensor is conserved for the first two. So Q is conserved um, if d mu t mu nu is zero for these guys. And for these other guys, um, conservation um, also requires t mu mu equals zero for these guys. Okay. So the theory has whatever operators it has, right? And suppose it has a, a, a stress tensor, and from that stress tensor we can construct these conserved charges. It's one of the space-time indices. So for instance, I would say that um, in this case, epsilon lambda is delta mu lambda. This is just a vector field notation for epsilon. Okay? And this way of thinking about conserved charges may not be very familiar. Um, but actually, the ni one nice thing about it, and there's been some work uh, on this in the last few years, this, uh, that this notion of conserved charge can be generalized um, from, so this is a co-dimension one uh, operator, but it can be generalized to any co-dimension operator. Okay, so this, this idea can be generalized to co-dimension n op, uh, conserved charges. So this corresponds to generalized global symmetries, where the charge objects are not local operators, but they could be line operators or surface operators and so on. And to measure the charge, we just have to surround them with um, a um, charge operator of the appropriate codimension. Okay. I'm not going to explain that, but I thought I should mention it. Um, and now, if we have, um, I'd like to define, we'd like to define a notion of these conserved charges as acting on the operators in the theory. Okay. So if I have an operator inserted at x, suppose the operator is O of x, we can define the charge Q. So define the charge Q acting on the operator O. 
So this is, we're going to get another local operator. The way this is defined is as a limit when the radius goes to zero of Q sigma R centered at X, O. So I take my operator O and I surround it with this conserved charge operator and then I take the limit when the radius of this small sphere goes to zero. And this is a way of defining a new, so this is a new local operator. So the conserved charges act on the local operators and gives a, give us back local operators. So the local operators transform in representations of the symmetry algebra. Yeah? Is the Euclidean setting? Uh, Euclidean setting. Exactly. Conservation is equ equivalent to the, this operator being topological. So if the, the, the theory has global symmetries, it has some topological, co-dimension one topological operators um, that um, can be used to measure the various charges. Okay. David Simmons often explains this in detail in his notes. This is roughly the idea. And then these, these conserved charges can be, since they act on the space of local operators and give us back local operators, so local operators transforming representations of these, the symmetry algebra, we can try to um, think about um, what those representations look like. So the way to do that is first to start with x equals zero, operators inserted at the origin. Um, what's nice about x equals zero is that this is a fixed point of um, um, rotations and dilatations. Um, so, and rotations, I didn't write the full algebra, but rotations commute with dilatations, roughly because the dilatation operator is a scalar. Uh, so it can't transform under rotations. So we can um, choose a basis of operators. O of zero. That diagonalizes. D and M mu nu. Since they commute, they're simultaneously diagonalizable. So what that means is that D acting on the operator at zero is some eigenvalue times the operator at zero. And M mu nu acting on the operator at zero is some eigenvalues, but um, uh, it's better to think about it. Um, instead of actually diagonalizing mu, we can just turn it into a block diagonal matrix. So the blocks, I can label them like this. S mu nu A B O um, B. Well, maybe if I want to be, if I want to follow David's convention, I can just do that and put an index A on these operators. So these operators transform in some representations of, of the rotation group. These are, so that's why they have an index. An index run, the index runs from one to the dimension of that representation. Um, and uh, this is just a set of numbers that um, corresponds to these matrices M mu nu in that representation. Okay, yeah. It started at the origin, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, acting with conserved charges takes local operators to local operators, so we can first think about the origin. And then we can think about what happens if we act with k mu and p mu, and as I said before, p mu raises the eigenvalue of d by one, and k mu lowers it by one. Um, so then we have this picture of um, 
well, we can have this is a possible representation of this conformal group. Uh, they're called lowest weight representations, irreducible representations, where we start with some operator O inserted at the origin. Let's say we call it O0. And then we act with, it has some scaling dimension. So this is scaling dimension or the eigenvalue of D, delta. And then we act on it with P mu. We get some operator O1. We act with it with P mu, we act on it with P mu again. We get O2 and so on. And this goes, it goes on forever. And to go back, so this, uh, after we act with P mu once, the scaling dimension would be delta plus one. Twice would be delta plus two, and so on. And to go back, we act with K mu. So it must be that if we act with K mu on the lowest one, we get zero. Um, okay. And this implies the notion of a conformal primary. So this is the conformal primary. So the conformal primary operators are the local operators um, with well-defined scaling dimensions transforming in a well-defined representation of the rotation group such that when put at the origin are annihilated by k mu. Okay. Conformal primary. And these guys that are obtained by acting with P mu are called descendants. Questions about this? This was operators of the origin. Operators away from the origin. Uh, we can figure out how those are acted on by um, all these conformal charges if we wanted. Um, I think it's good to write down how they're acted on by D. So as I said before, so D when acting on an operator at the origin gives delta times that operator. But question, what does D do when acting on an operator at X? Well, we can just do the calculation. First of all, what is an operator at x? Uh, here we had just operators at the origin so far. An operator at x, I can define it um, by saying that uh, this is e to the x dot p acting on the operator at the origin. p is the translation operator. Um, and uh, in this language of surface operators, this is how we translate by x. Hey, um, yeah. Good. Uh, let me try to explain that. If you think about the action of operators of these conserved charges as I, as I defined it, where um, you surround the operator by some co-dimension one operator, then you don't have to conjugate it. But, so suppose I have some operator O here, and I'm surrounding it by a conserved charge operator Q. Since the conserved charge operator is topological, I can deform this surface any way I want. And I get the same answer. So in particular, I can deform it to be of this type, O of zero, and to look like that. And this, so suppose that, for instance, the time direction runs in, runs like this, T. Um, okay. And this can be interpreted as, now you, now you see this conserved charge operator acts at a, at a given time. Um, so I can interpret this as because of the different orientations of the surface, this one's oriented this way, this one's oriented that way, I can interpret this as Q times O minus O times Q. So this would be the commutator between Q and O. This 
Yes, this would be inside a correlator where, where there's time ordering. Okay. So, um, if you define this uh, surface to be two parallel planes, you can have this Q acting on the operator as, you can write it as Q at some time times O minus Q at some other time times O. Same thing, same thing with uh, a position. And then when you exponentiate it, you're going to get um, you're going to get um, e to the x times p on the left and e to the minus x dot p on the right. So the difference is just is just which uh, what kind of surface operator I'm surrounding my local operator with. If I surround it with spheres, then the action is defined as as before. If I if I think of this as being one plane at some x and some other plane is minus x, then um, uh, it would be e to the x dot p, O of zero, e to the minus x dot p. Yeah? Are you using the representation of p where it's just derivative? Yeah. Uh, same reason that it's not commutator, d o equals delta of o, it's just d times o. Right, delta but with this, in, a certain, in a certain quantization of the theory, you can interpret this as a, as a commutator. Yeah, yeah. Once you once you quantize the theory, yes. Because the the these operators are topological, so I can turn a sphere into two planes. Okay. So then, um, you know, I can just figure out what d of o of x is. So this is d e to the p dot x o of zero, and then I can write this as e to the p dot x e to the minus p dot x d e to the p dot x o of zero. Now I can think of these things here as elements of, uh, well, I can think of p and d as, as um, Lie algebra elements. So then to evaluate this quantity, we can use the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. So this is b c h. This gives d plus commutator d with p dot x. So this is the same as d plus x mu p mu. And p mu, p mu acts as a derivative. So, and you know, and this thing here translates it, translates it to x back to x. When you think about this, you get a d acting on O of x is equal to uh, delta plus x mu d mu O of x. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is this follows from a simple application of the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. Um, and similarly, we can figure out what uh, mu nu is when acting on an operator at x, and um, what k mu is when acting on an operator at x, and so on. Okay. So now, since we've done this, the next thing to know is how the correlation functions behave. Um, well, how they're restricted by the symmetry. And I assume people know this. So, correlation functions. So, let's just talk about correlation functions of scalar primaries. let's say OI um, with dimension delta I. Um, the simplest thing is uh, one-point functions. The one-point function of an operator O 
is um, zero unless O is the identity operator. Two point functions O1 at X1, O2 at X2. By rotational invariance, this is just a function of x1 minus x2. But since the theory is, has all these symmetries, it should be invariant, that function should be invariant under the action of D on both operators. So then we can just write down, there's a, there's a differential equation, delta 1 plus x mu d mu, x, sorry, delta 1 plus x1 mu d1 mu plus delta 2 x2 mu d2 mu acting on this thing should be zero. So that implies that um, um, that implies so it, this the fact that it's invariant under dilatations. Okay, so let me write like this. So this is f of x1 minus x2. The fact that d acting on this is zero implies that f um, is um, 1 over, sorry, yeah, 1 over x1 minus x2 to the power um, delta 1 plus delta 2. So that, that's just using dilatation symmetry. If we now further require that this correlation function is invariant under special conformal transformations, so k mu acting on this is 0, this implies that um, the two-point function O1 of x1, O2 of x2 is zero if delta 1 is not equal to delta 2. So, choose a basis of operators such that, um, so the only non-zero two-point functions are between operators with the same scaling dimension. And we can choose it such that, choose these operators such that OI of X1, OJ of X2 is delta IJ over X1 minus X2. Um, sorry, here F is a constant over this. We can choose the constant to be 1 by normalizing the operators. So this would be 2 delta i. Yeah? Sorry, uh, I had some questions about this. Yes. So I'm going to measure my O at one point, and I'm going to get 0 on average. But I'm going to measure that 0 with infinite variance of what's the difference. Xi equals x <coughs> Sorry, x1 equals x2. I just want to measure right. operator x1, period. And I get 0 on average. Now right. Know what the variance of my measurements are. I do yes. Where I get infinite variance. How does that make sense physically? I mean, that's true in other things. Well, infinitely. right. That's a thing about quantum field theory. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are large, there are large fluctuations. There are, yeah, to get larger and larger as you put the um, operators closer and closer together. Well, I mean, you can see it. You can see it from, you know, from these formulas. Uh, what's the physical reason for that? Um, was that? Uh, yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't imply that it should be infinite. And the question is about whether it's the infinite versus finite. In the quantum field theory, there are large fluctuations. I mean, I guess you can just say, like, my measurement apparatus, but the finite, like, you know, like, I can never actually measure it. Or, sorry, yeah. Well, I mean, it all has to do eventually with the uncertainty principle, I suppose. Um, Um, 
we can, we can, um, but you can redefine, so suppose we have some operators such that the matrix of two-point functions is not diagonal as I wrote it, then we can just diagonalize it. So that would be a convenient way of finding a basis. Um, okay. Um, I can, I mean, just to give you an idea of what, what this looks like for operators with spin. So this was for scalar operators. For operators with spin, we have O mu 1 through mu L at x1. Let's just take one of, the, one of them at x and the other one at 0. O mu 1, let's say, sorry, nu 1 through nu L at 0. So, you know, the form of the two-point function was fixed by, uh, of, of scalars was fixed by conformal invariance to this simple thing. For operators with spin, it's also fixed, but to a much more complicated thing. Okay? So this is a constant that depends on the operator times something that takes care of these indices. And I'll write this as i mu 1 nu 1 at x i mu 2 nu 2 at x and so on i mu l nu l divided by if the, the operator has dimension um, delta um, then this would be uh, x to the power 2 delta where um, well it's not quite complete so what does it mean to have operators with spin first of all well, they have several Lorentz indices that are symmetrized and the traces are removed because if we contract two of them, we can get an operator with a lower spin. Okay? So, this, these operators are symmetric and traceless in these indices. In order, on the right-hand side, to have something that's symmetric and traceless, well, we should just symmetrize, say, the mu's and remove the traces. So this would be the formula. And now I have to tell you what i mu nu is. At x is delta mu nu minus x mu x nu divided by x squared. Yes? Um, delta functions sometimes are possible. Um, um, I'm just thinking about correlation functions at separated points. Um, okay. So that's two point functions. The next thing is three point functions. So I'll just write down the formula so that people have it in their minds. I'm not going to derive it. Yes. In three dimensions, this is all there is. Yeah. Uh, there could also be spinner representations, but then not talking about spinners yet. Um, okay. Um, three point functions. Um, so they look like this O1 at x1, O2 at x2, O3 at x3. This is some constant F123 divided by x12 to the power. Um, delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3, x2, 3 to the power delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1, um, x1, 3 to the power delta 1 plus delta 3 minus delta 2, where xij is xi minus xj. Okay? 
I assume people have seen this formula before. So the three-point functions are determined only up to this overall constant. For operators with spin, of course, it's more complicated because if these operators have indices, then we have to have here some, some function um, that depends on those indices and the x's, like for the two-point function. I'm not going to write down the formula. It's pretty, it gets pretty complicated very easily. Four-point functions. And this is actually going to be important. Well, all of this was important. Now suppose we have a, um, a four-point function O1 through O4. So if you work out the constraints that follow from conformal invariance, get that this is, well, so let me assume for now that delta 1 is delta 2, delta 3, delta 4 is equal to delta. So the operators have the same scaling dimensions. Otherwise, the formulas are going to get more complicated. So this is 1 over x12 to the 2 delta, x34 to the 2 delta times some function g of um, two variables u and v that are related to x1 through x4. In the following way, u is defined as x12 squared, x34 squared, divided by x13 squared, x24 squared, and v is x14 squared, x23 squared, over x13 squared, x24 squared. These ratios are invariant under conformal transformations. Under all conformal transformations. Okay? That is the four point function. Um, one important property of this four point function is, um, or the set of all four point functions, is crossing. So let me write that. So let me write it, it's simplest to write it for identical operators. Otherwise it gets more complicated. So let's assume that O1 and O4 through O4 are the same and they're called O. So then I can write this four point function in several ways. So I can write like this, uh, OX1 through O of X4 is as I wrote it above, one over x12 to the two delta x34 to the two delta times g of uv. But since the operators are the same, you know, x1 through x4 are just labels. These are Euclidean correlators. You can always interchange the order of the operators and rename x1 through x4. So I can, for instance, rename 1 to 3, x1 to x3, and x3 to x1. And if we do that, we get what? We get 1 over, so x1 is x3, and x3 is x1. So here we get x23 to the 2 delta x14 to the 2 delta times some function. Well, it's the same function, but evaluated at a different point that's obtained by renaming by interchanging x1 and x3. So what happens if we interchange x1 and x3? The denominators stay unchanged. And in the numerator, if I replace this with 3, and I replace this with 1, I get exactly the other one. Right? So under x1 goes to x3, u and v get interchanged. So it's this uh, times g evaluated at v comma u. Of course, the interchange 1, 3 is not the only one I can do. I can also interchange um, 1 and 4, for instance. Um, let me try to figure out. Uh, 
on, just one second. Um, right, we can interchange one and four. We can interchange, you know, any any pair. It turns out that you can generate all possible interchanges from just two of them, interchanging one and three, and interchanging one and two. So let me write this again, where we interchange one and two. If we interchange one and two, the power up front stays unchanged. So x one two to the two delta, x three four to the two delta. But interchanging one and two actually changes u and v. It doesn't change the numerator of u, but um, it changes the denominator. It also changes this denominator. It also changes the numerator over there. You can work out what that does. So interchanging one and two is the same as sending u to u over v and sending v to one over v. So this is uh, the same four point function as one over x one two to the two delta one over x three four to the two delta times g evaluated at um, u over v one over and one over v. Is this clear? The reason why I consider the same operator is that under the, these interchanges, the, the interchanges map the four-point function to itself. If we have different operators, these interchanges would map this four-point function to a different four-point function. But if we consider the set of all four-point functions, they get um, mapped to the same set. Okay. So for identical operators, g of u of v must be the same as g of u over v and 1 over v and g of u of v. So this is just setting this one equal to that one. Interpreting this relation is a little more complicated because we have to bring, so for instance, we bring this x23, x14 to the left hand side. And if you look at what this is, this is this can be written in terms of u and v. If you work through the algebra, you get that g of u v is u over v to the delta um, times g of v u. Where this u over v to the delta just comes from um, the fact that the prefactors are different. Okay. Questions? Can I completely specify the CFT with all the three point information? Every single one. All the three. Um, uh, yes, but, um, well, that's, sorry, the, the, answer, the answer is no, for two reasons. Um, one reason is that um, specifying the OP coefficient may not be consistent with other principles like unitarity that I was going to mention now. Okay? So there are cons there's consistency conditions that one has to take into account. And um, uh, second is that this only gives us information about the local operators. There might, th the theories might also have non-local operators and there might be additional data associated with those operators. I'm not sure about 2D, but certainly in 3D because, you know, Chern Simon's theory is an example of a CFD that doesn't have any local operators but has non local operators. So clearly, specifying all the OP coefficients in that case doesn't specify the theory. Okay? So, okay, another thing, We're working towards the bootstrap. Um, unitarity constraints um, so so far I've been talking about Euclidean theories so if you have here Euclidean Um, and uh, 
uh, you can continue this theory to Lorentzian signature. But in order to do so, uh, we have to specify which direction is uh, time. So suppose that uh, time goes in this direction. So the time slices are like this. Um, now, when we quantize the theory, we associate a Hilbert space with each of these time slices. And the operator that takes us from one time slice to the next is the time evolution operator, which is e to the minus i h Lorentzian t Lorentzian. And indeed, O of in Lorentzian signature, O of t and x, maybe I can just write it on the next board. I guess one thing that might be confusing about this is that it all depends on uh, which direction is time. Um, and it, and it, it really does. I mean, uh, if we take time to go in a different direction, it could be a completely different Hilbert space. Okay? So Hilbert space that we're talking about depends on which direction we call time. Um, and the operator of t, uh, t and x um, is e to the i h l t Lorentzian O of 0 and x e to the minus i um, h Lorentzian t Lorentzian where L, h l is a Hermitian operator. So in order to go from uh, Lorentzian so this is t Lorentzian in order to go from Lorentzian to Euclidean, we just, just insert an i. So t Lorentzian, say we say we set t Lorentzian as well, minus i times t Euclidean. And in Lorentzian signature, operators are um, that act on the Hilbert space. Uh, operators associated with observables are Hermitians, Hermitian operators. Um, so O dagger is O, okay? Uh, the same time and X. However, if we try to write this in terms of the Euclidean time, we get E to the H Lorentzian TE. Just plug in that formula, TL is minus I T E. O of zero and X. E to the minus H Lorentzian times TE. So then the condition, the hermeticity condition, so O of T Lorentzian X dagger is equal to O of T Lorentzian X in Euclidean signature becomes O of T Euclidean and X is conjugate is O of minus T Euclidean and X. So while in Lorentzian signature, conjugation relates operators at the same time uh, to each other in Lorentzian signature, oh, sorry, in Lorentzian signature, this happens in Lorentzian signature, in Euclidean signature, conjugation, the same conjugation, the one from Lorentzian signature, the same conjugation relates the operators of TE to the operators minus TE. And this relation depends on which conjugation we're talking about. So this conjugation I'm talking about here is associated with this particular direction as being interpreted as time. If I were to interpret a different direction as time, this relation in Euclidean signature would change. Okay? So this conjugation is just some action on the space of all operators that relates operators at some point to the operators at some other point. Um, okay? And uh, in particular, what this implies, for instance, is a property called reflection positivity. for Euclidean correlators, and that's related to unitarity in Lorentzian signature in this way. And uh, so that property is that O of minus TE and X, O of TE and X, 
this two point function, because of this conjugation property, this is the same as a norm of O, T, E, and X acting on the vacuum squared, so this should be positive. So correlation functions that are, for instance, two point functions, but generalize it to higher point functions that are reflection symmetric about some um, plane, the direction perpendicular to that plane is interpreted as a, as a time direction. So all correlation functions that are symmetric, where the operators are symmetric, um, have to be positive. That's a consequence of unitarity from Lorentzian signature. Okay? So in particular, when I wrote down the form of the two-point function being this, this implies that um, C is bigger than zero. And of course, for these operators with spin, it's a little more complicated. But we can take the Lorentz indices to be in the directions perpendicular, sorry, in the directions um, perpendicular to the time axis. And then um, one can derive a positivity condition for CO as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, b I believe that's true. Yes. In the continuum, in the continuum case, yes. Um, I think if you have lattice models, the situation could be different. Um, however, this is not the only um, conjugation that's useful. There's another conjugation that comes from radial quantization. Where, I mean, the way to think about it is this. So you start with your flat space. This space, the metric on this space is dr squared plus r squared, the metric on S2. This is related, I can, I can write this as e to the, sorry, if I make it the definition, r is e to the tau. I can write this as e to the 2 tau times d tau squared plus d s2 squared. So this space is related up to an overall scale factor to a cylinder. So it's related to something like this, where the base of the cylinder is a two sphere, and this direction is parameterized by tau. Um, and it's possible to continue this direction, this tau direction, to Lorentzian signature and interpret this as a time direction. And that imposes different, um, different uh, conjugation uh, relation. Um, okay, so send tau to uh, Lorentzian time. And what that does is that um, it Im implies the following relation for scalars. And I'll stop here with this. So O of X conjugate is um, one over X to the two delta times O evaluated X over X squared. So this is the, um, the um, uh, unitarity implies this relation. So again, in Euclidean signature, the conjugation relates operator at some point with operator at some other point. In this case, although the, the relations uh, seems uh, pretty complicated. Um, here I wrote the operators in flat space. So I can think of flat mapping the flat space to the cylinder then I interpret this time direction as, um, the Euclidean, as Euclidean time direction and continue it to Lorentzian time. I impose the unitarity condition. In that setting, unitarity relates operators at some point to operators at the same point. And then I continue it back to Euclidean signature and try to 
see what it implies about the operators in flat space, and this is the condition that it implies. Okay, so it relates the operator at x to an operator to an operator at x over x squared. I suppose I'm probably supposed to stop soon. Just about now. So uh, I will continue this afternoon. Um, have an operator state correspondence. Well, I believe I can think of, yeah, I believe so. I believe I can think of um, um, uh, acting with some operator as um, um, generating or changing the state on one of these slices. Um, where did I use conformal symmetry? I don't think I used conformal symmetry. Well, I mean, certainly I can foliate this, this space with slices, and on each slice there's a Hilbert space, so the Hilbert space has states. And then I can try to think about what happens if I act with the operators on that Hilbert space. So suppose I take an operator and act on the vacuum, it definitely creates a state. Perhaps the other way may not work. I'm not sure. Uh, right, the state that I, if I start with a state, the question is, I mean, the question is, is a local operator related to a state or not? Um, and I think that's probably false. But what's true is that if I allow myself to not just talk about local operators, I also talk about non-local operators, then they are probably related to states. I can think, if I start with an arbitrary state, I can think about the, uh, an operator that would create that state when acting on the vacuum. It would be, it would be a non-local operator. Um, you mean it's not... Right, if I want to talk about normalizable states, then for sure uh, I have to think about non-local operators because with a local operator I create a non-normalizable state in, in, uh, in this way of quantizing the theory. Um, right. Right, so for local operators I don't think that's yeah, I don't think there's a st state op operator correspondence. What's interesting about this one is that local operators would correspond will correspond to states. Not not so much even though there are a few papers about this. Yeah, yeah, I can, you know, if you have two line operators, for instance, you know, this, these surface operators are more complicated. They're also more boring because they're topological, but suppose we have line operators. Um, then, uh, yeah, you can, you can construct OPs and things like that. Um, but in that case, I don't think that the two-point function, well, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I think the, pos all the positivity conditions are not, the, the positivity conditions that are needed for the bootstrap may not <coughs> be there. But maybe it's just my ignorance about the subject. One more question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Either one, yeah, I think they are equivalent. So if, 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 if you can, yeah, I believe so, uh, but I don't have uh, the 
argument in mind now. Um, I believe that's true. People aren't talking about two different notions of unitarity. It's like the, the answer is more like, you know, from a sociological point of view, someone would have told me <laughs> if, they, if, there are two if there are two different notions of unitarity. So I, I, believe it's, I believe it's the same, but I need to think about it. Like that. And it works automatically. And it works automatically.